I, the Prime Minister even have to ask me to go out, no, has to ask me to go out and defend the Prime Minister. I will do it if I think he's being unfairly attacked. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Women with Balls, where I, Katie Balls, speak to today's trailblazers. My guest today was born in Liverpool to an Irish Catholic father and a Protestant mother. At the age of 16, she left school and soon after trained as a nurse at Warrington General Hospital before starting her own business, a child daycare service for working parents. She then made her move into politics, firstly as an advisor to Oliver Letwin, and then in 2005, she won her seat in Mid Bedfordshire with 11,000 majority in Parliament. She quickly made waves as a politician willing to speak her mind, describing the Tory leaders, David Cameron and George Osborne, as two arrogant posh boys with no passion to want or understand the lives of others. She also made history as the first sitting MP to appear on reality television through I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, leading to her brief suspension. A best-selling novelist, she joined the Department of Health in 2019 and was appointed Minister for Mental Health and Patient Safety. But her biggest promotion came last year when Boris Johnson named her as the new Culture Secretary. Since taking on the role, she has regularly made the news for her bid to rid the arts and media world of snobbery and elitism, and is now charged with steering the online harms bill through Parliament, the privatisation of Channel 4, and what happens to Chelsea Football Club. And that's before we get to the BBC. All while finding time to defend the Prime Minister from criticism. My guest today is Nadine Dorries. Nadine, thank you for joining us today on this podcast. Um, you've been on our list for some time, so we're very happy to have you in the room. Um, on this podcast, we tend to begin by asking everyone the same question, which is, was yours a happy childhood? As I mentioned, you grew up in Liverpool. Yeah, it was, um, it was a difficult childhood. We were incredibly poor. Um, my father was quite ill. And um, there was not kind of like the welfare state benefit system that there is today. So it was a tough childhood, actually, very tough. And um, I could recount, you know, dozens of stories. But sometimes I feel it just sounds like I'm saying, oh, you know, we had no shoes. But, you know, we didn't. (laughs) And it's kind of, I do remember hiding under the sink from the rent man. And, um, yeah, when the rent man came. So it was a tough childhood. Yeah, you, you grew up on a, on a council estate, and I wondered at that time, um, what, what was the politics of Liverpool? I've mentioned your um, parents' different re- religions. Uh, were you very aware of, of it? Oh, so aware of it. So aware of it that I remember even as um, a, at three years of age, um, my grandmother and my mother arguing because my mother hadn't been churched after having my brother and it was it was very much a divide between the Catholic side of my father's family and the Protestant side of my mother's family. I mean, I don't think people today would actually, who weren't aware of what it was like in Liverpool in the 1960s, would really understand what it was like. But it was, it was very much, you know, political. Everybody in Liverpool in those days spoke about religion, uh, politics or football. It was the burning passion of conversations and... And I've, you know, I've said I remember as a child lying on the floor, falling asleep while those conversations raged over my head. So I was kind of born and brought up in politics and interestingly in football, uh, because my great grandfather was one of the founders of Everton Football Club. And um, yeah, and religion is, is those were the three kind of things that I grew up um, in and were imbued by as I grew up. And did you start to identify as a Tory from a young age or when, when you were seeing all this politics? Or were you developing so your... that's really interesting, actually, because I went through a what am I? I remember standing on our front step while our neighbour Sue Manning was scrubbing her step. And it was an election. It was in the early 70s. And I remember asking her, who are you voting for? I wasn't old enough to vote. And she went, um, I'm voting for... Uh, we're going to vote for Labour because they're the they're the party of the workers, and and I said to my mum, who I think it was my mum I asked, who are we voting for? And she said, we're voting for the party of the family, the Tories, and so already there were those those divisions. It might have been Sue actually who said she was going to vote for the for the party of the family, but there was definitely that you know one's the party for the family, and one's the party for the workers, and that was 
And I remember being aware of that from quite a young age. But when Right to Buy came in, it was really Margaret Thatcher that, that shaped my political ideology. Because when Right to Buy came in, we, for, for my family and many families in our council estate, that was literally like somebody from Westminster putting a hand into our council estate and lifting people up. And, you know, everybody had packing cases dividing their gardens and everybody's front door was the same colour that the council painted it, which was a dark green. And as people began to buy their houses through Right to Buy, the packing cases were ripped up, the front doors all became, and everyone's individuality came into the street. And you'd see flowers being planted in what was just a little strip of land in front of the, the garden in front of the house. The metal railings that were just taken away. And it was, you know, watching that, I remember seeing that transformation. I remember asking my dad, why the people across the road were taking the packing cases up that were dividing their garden from next door. He said, oh, they bought their house this week. They're putting in a fence. And it was that. And I think Labour, Tony Blair's ideology, the ideology of new, new Labour to remove right to buy, for me was kind of, why would you do that? Why would you remove that whole layer of social mobility, that, that ladder out for people? And so that really is what formed my, made me a Tory was right to buy. Um, at 16, you leave school and you train as a nurse. Um, lots of, obviously, your colleagues on this uh, podcast come on, they talk about their time at Oxbridge. And I wondered, <laughs> when you were at school, was university like pitched as an option? Was it, was it never really on, on the table? No, it's interesting, actually, because um, I remember one of the boys from my school going to, I used to get the bus and he was in the bus and I knew it was his last day. And I said to him, so where are you going to? And he went, I'm going to Oxford. And I went, where's that? I had no idea what it was. I had no idea where it was. And he was going to, so I remember, um, and my mum saying to me, he, his mum and dad are really proud, he's going to Oxford. And I remember thinking, how did he do that? How did he, how did he manage to do that? I had no idea what even a university was at that point. Nobody did. University was not something that was talked about. You went to Fords. If you wanted a good job, you went to work at Fords on nights. And you train as a nurse. Um, and then you go on to spend a year in Africa. And you come back and you start your own business? I, I was, well, obviously, I, was, I, had my, I had my eldest daughter and I was still nursing. But then we decided to start, um, I decided to start my own business, yeah, which was, it was at 1991. Yeah, 1991, that I decided. And it was, again, very much, you won't remember because you're too young, but the the issue of women not returning to work was huge. Something like 92% of women did not return to the workplace when they had a baby. And, and the reason why was because there was absolutely no childcare and no childcare support. And, um, and there was a huge problem of benefit in kind uh, taxation if employers try to assist women to get them back into the workplace. And so I decided to establish my own consultancy at the time, which was Company Kids. And, and it was just, it was, I was just, had the right idea. It was, a, it was a business I started from an original concept of my own concept, but it was the right place and the right time because I literally just went around organisations where I knew they had a high number of very valuable females who were going to go on maternity leave and not return. So Glaxo, Pfizer, Smith Klein Beecham as it was at the time, Shell, Procter and Gamble, Goldman Sachs, and and they were I never did a day's advertising. I just went into each of those businesses, tailored a, a support package for their, their women. So when they went on maternity leave, they became my responsibility until they returned. And it was our job to get their childcare in place. And it just went from the word of mouth from one chief executive to another. And then I sold it to Bupa in 1998. Um, the year of three daughters, was it was your experience of motherhood? Um, did it impact that a lot in the sense that you were kind of thinking yourself about how you balance that with a career? Yeah, no, it did. And it was very much, you know, having a family myself and still wanting to have a career myself and realising my options were incredibly limited. It was a bit of a shock to me. It was kind of, wow, I didn't realise it was going to be so hard to... The expectation is that I should always be a stay-at-home mum. And that's what really helped me to, to kind of have the idea of the business. Um, so that's a bit of a cliche, really, doesn't it? Not really. I mean, I, I still think there's lots of people who aren't having children because they just don't think they can 
it's I think there's lots of women that still feels as though it's career versus children yeah very much so so um so at what point do you start to think I want a career in politics because you sell the company um and it during, was at that point yeah. Yeah. It was literally, I remember sat in the first thing, I remember my husband was driving and I was reading the Telegraph newspaper and it was something Ken Clark had said which absolutely infuriated me and I remember my husband saying to me, well, instead of complaining from the outside, why don't you get involved and do something from the inside? You've sold the business now, you can do whatever you like. And I thought, you're right, as he often was about most things. I thought, you're right, yeah, I can. So, and I just, um, I joined the party um, met a few people. And did you just know it would be the Tory party at that point, yeah? So, yeah, um, that was when I kind of, yeah, it was pre-97. I joined the party in, I think, 96 or 97. And it was when the party was completely just, you know, disintegrating. And and I, I yeah, I knew. I mean, it was... I, I read an interview that Tony Blair had given in the Sunday Times in a magazine... And I realised now that was a big interview at the time for him. And it was a really good interview. But again, it just came back to social mobility and, and things like Right to Buy for me. And of course, everything Margaret Thatcher had done. I mean, she was a hero on, you know, where I came from. So the fact that she, in what are now called red wall seats like mine, I remember a car coming around with a loudspeaker on the top um, during the election and kids running after it shouting Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher. You know, you just that kind of reach that she had into backgrounds where people like me came from, that was the kind of person, the party I wanted to be a part of. Now, so your route to politics, let's go for it, because you stood in one seat before you won your seat. Mm-hmm. And you also advised um, Oliver Letwin. H- how, how was that experience? Was it a meeting of minds? <laughs> Actually, Oliver and I got on really, really well. I I really liked Oliver. Um, he was the, this uh, as individuals go, he's more scatty than me. But I really liked Oliver. Yeah, then we got on very well. So you enter Parliament. What surprises you? It's just about everything. And yeah, I've been working there for. I've been downstairs in Shadow Cabinet Block for four years. But wow, just about everything. It was. I remember John Hayes saying to me um, in the tea room. He said, Do "You know who you remind me of." And he said, you're like Alice in Wonderland in that book. You look like you've just fallen down the hole in the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and you're blinking and looking at what people are saying, like we're talking a different language. And he said, and you're right, it is like the Mad Hatter's Tea Party here. And it really, that's what it felt like to me. People were talking in alien concepts and languages and it was just, it was a bit, it was as far removed from normal as anything could have been. Did you feel like you didn't belong there? or did yeah. You, yeah, yeah, very much so very much like what have I done and this is just not a normal place to be yeah and even in terms of colleagues on your own side yeah 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 it was just I realized that there were some very interesting characters around um there's a leadership contest uh you initially backed David Davis I did yeah um then I think you would draw your support for David Davis So I did. There was something that happened, really. It was uh, tactics used to discredit David Cameron, and which I wasn't really happy with. And so I just didn't want... You know, I was pretty new into politics. I did not want to be a part of that. So it was... Which is really interesting, because now it would look as though it's just small fry. Yeah, a lot has changed. Um, How did... Let's talk about David Cameron briefly as leader, because I mentioned the introduction, obviously, your comments about... David Cameron and George Osborne, which spread far and wide. But I wanted to, so you're in Parliament. It's a strange. Well, experience. I think they kind of hit yeah. a pulse at a time. I think it was they did. I mean, I was shocked at the pickup because it was huge. But I think it was almost though I'd said something that people were thinking, but I'd been the first person to say it. What happens when you say that? Do, do, do you have uh, people calling you, you know, linked to them or even the people themselves to say you shouldn't have said that or, or do you find actually you're just in political Siberia and, and people aren't reaching out? No, I was actually, I regretted calling them um, posh boys in a way because it kind of, it was, it was not really what I meant. What I meant was probably privileged boys and I should have used that word rather than the posh boys, I think. What I was trying to say was that, actually, I think 
in politics, people do need to be able to relate to the lives of people that you're governing for. And, and I felt with, at the time, with Dave and George, as though they weren't actually doing that. And, and I may have been wrong, you know, maybe they were relating, but didn't look as though they were. Everything looked very, everything I saw was irritating me because it was almost boys boarding school type behavior, very chummy and very, very jokey. And, and it wasn't really, it didn't seem serious enough to me or relatable enough to certainly from the background that I'd come from and the problems that people living in that I knew and still know today and I'm still friends with people I was at school with and it didn't feel to me as though they were really relating to the problems of the day in a serious way and and that's just what it was really and it was I probably just said shouldn't have said it but I did. Um, it seems in your career in politics you've often done things a little bit differently um, and, I, and I don't know if that's perhaps not knowing the rules or actually just choosing to do things your own way. Um, I think it's probably a bit of my autism as well, to be honest. So it's kind of like, that that definitely comes into play. But it's, um, yeah, I do. But yeah, my special advisor has a hard time. So I I do do things a bit differently. Um, One of those was uh, I'm a Celebrity, which I did mention in the introduction. Um, And you go on the show, at the time you were a backbencher, um, but there's a big for all while you're on it. I think you're suspended half halfway through or, or while you're on the show. Um, is that the case? Do they, do they tell you that you're facing suspension from the Tory party or having the whip removed? Sorry. Yeah, actually, the person, the first person I spoke to when I was in Australia was Fraser Nelson. <laughs> so he was the first person to get through to me when I got out of the jungle. I think Fraser told me. So... Um, which is interesting. But what was more interesting was um, was what Fraser told me, which is that the chief whip at the time was denying that he knew I'd gone and he was doing it from his sunbed in the Bahamas. So, you know, Fraser Nelson told me that. And, um, and I was kind of slightly shocked because the chief whip did know I was going. I'd gone to see him. I'd had a meeting with him and told him. And so I was kind of slightly stunned that he was saying that he didn't know I'd gone. And that, um, and I was stunned that Fraser had told me that he was doing it from his sunbed in the Bahamas because, of course, Parliament was on recess at the time. And I missed no government votes while I was away at all. But, of course, you know, the spin and the way it's portrayed was that I'd deserted government, and which wasn't the case at all. The chief whip, actually, uh, the former chief whip, Andrew Mitchell, actually came up to me and apologised uh, a little while afterwards and said, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's all very very uh very pressured at the time and so he apologized for having said that he didn't know but he did know um you've also appeared on channel four in a few um of their kind of documentaries back back in that period too and i just wondered for you do you think it's important it's one of the things you're trying to do is to show the public more of what politicians do is that one of the driving forces or i think at the time i just found opposition so utterly boring (laughs) and Uh, parliament to be fair at the time. You got to go to just, Australia, right? So, yeah, just did more interesting things. Now, at this point, I wonder in your career, do you, opposition, backbench, but I also wonder in the sense that because you are speaking your mind, because you are facing things like that suspension, do you think that you're almost destined for a life on the backbenches? Are, are you imagining, were there points when you thought you're never going to be in government? Oh, I never, never really um, intended to be, ever. So it was... I thought I got into politics too late. I think I was 49 when I became an MP. And I thought it was definitely a younger person's job to be. You needed to be in there from your 20s. And I realised, I, you know, I've been a life in business and nursing and healthcare. And I just didn't think that getting into um, government was my destiny at all. It was to be a constituency MP and to, um, to be a backbencher. Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister and he has he was he a friend of yours early on in when did you kind of cross so Boris and I shared an office near to each other in um Norman Shore North when I was first an MP and we kind of struck up a friendship from those days and I just found him and whereas whereas in my first days as an MP a lot of um the MPs who were there were were very stuffy and not all were friendly Boris was just incredibly helpful, incredibly, he spoke to everybody the same, whether, you know, you were me from my background or, and had no idea, not a clue what was going on at the time, 
or you were somebody who was, you know, an academic. You just spoke to everybody exactly the same. And I kind of appreciated that. And I remember having some constituents down and they were like, in awe because they just met him. And he took them into his office and he made them a cup of tea. And, and he was just like, just such a nice guy. And yeah, really got on well with him. And I always found it quite funny, actually, because it was like, yin and yang, you know, our backgrounds couldn't have been, at the time, I thought more different. I've since learned that actually his background was not um, the amazing background that he's portrayed as being, you know, another posh boy. He actually had it very tough as a kid as well. So Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister and then you are on the and min, the ministerial ladder, first in the Department of Health. And and in terms of that brief, I mean, you were under secretary and then moved up to Minister of State. So during that period, what do you have to change about yourself? Do you, do you what, is the, what is the biggest change from moving from backbencher to minister in terms of how you approach politics? Oh, it's, I mean, it's huge. It was, um, <laughs> I think the hours that you have to work as a minister were a, a, certainly a shock it's it's seven days a week um maybe not as as intensive as it is a such of state but it's certainly you know it's quite full on and of course i was in health and we had the pandemic in 2020 so i was there right in fact i walked into matt hancock's office and was stood at the other side of the desk when he got the phone call and we knew what we were dealing with with covid so it was to be in health as a minister throughout the COVID pandemic was, um, yeah, that was, that was just full on. It was like there was no such thing as a life. It was working from early in the morning to late at night, seven days a week. What point was that when, when um, Matt Hancock got the phone call? It was on the Thursday and then I was diagnosed on the Friday. And, and I was told by Professor Keith Willis, who phoned me that night, whose first two words I probably can't, um, or was it Matt's actually? <laughs> so there was a bit of a shock because um, nobody expected, you know, anybody that they knew to get it. And uh, Keith basically told me I was patient zero. I was the first person in the UK to be tested and diagnosed who had not been abroad. And th- they now knew at that moment they were looking at something far more serious. So it was... That kind of like, I knew just a few days before that we were dealing with something from abroad that was being brought into the UK, but just like 24 hours later, we knew that it was actually people within the UK was spreading between. So it was, it was a a bit of a, um, it was a bit of a difficult time for us in health at the time, because then of course we all started going down with it one after the other. And I'd been to the International Women's Day uh, lunch with the Prime Minister and lots of other members of the cabinet. So, yeah. Yeah, suddenly are you getting lots of messages from people about COVID contacts at that point or gosh I mean it was we hadn't even got a testing regime up yeah. at that point we hadn't got we didn't have tests that we could you know use mass tests between individuals it was every day was and as soon as I was fit to be back at work I was back at work where we were doing exactly that my job was nosecomial infections in hospitals and which comes under patient safety because it was you know a bit of a why is it that people are going into hospital without COVID and we've got people in PPE and red and green areas and everything's separated and isolated out and people are coming in healthy and they're still catching COVID when they come into hospital. That was my particular, uh, the Nightingale hospitals, you know. There was, it was the, the amount of work that needed to be achieved in a very short space of time. And we were literally every day, you know, being faced with new information, new data, new facts that we had to respond to worldwide information that was coming in about what was happening over the world globally not just in the UK what was happening in our care homes what was happening in hospitals what was happening in community transmission what was happening with the different variants how the virus was mutating there was so much to deal with and there was you know five of us ministers Matt and you know four others of us it was just a full-on amount of work quite the initiation um now i want to talk about your current brief because of course we do have limited time on this podcast um unfortunately <laughs> um but so you're appointed as culture culture secretary um the prime minister appoints you are you surprised did you have a sense that this could be coming were you uh, I, I never quite understood i know these things you sounded out a bit before so i was exhausted after two years in mental health and um, patient safety i was exhausted and so i was ready to go home 
and and I told them that and I'd given all my clothes away to Afghani women who were being returned to the UK I'd taken seven bin bags of clothes and a drop-off point just a few days before and I was ready to go home and then I got a phone call which was a lovely phone call actually saying the car's going to bring you over to Downing Street enjoy the walk up to the front door and I was going what for he wants he doesn't even need to speak to me or he can just speak to me in the commons why do I have to go to number 10 and it was uh, definitely went Nadine just enjoy the moment and I thought this is ridiculous because this is early in the afternoon why am I going up so early in the afternoon and um yeah and it was it's a day I'll never forget I remember being taken to a room in Downing Street on my own I still had my phone with me and my kids were texting me and they were going mum mum Laura Kunzberg says you've got DCMS I was going, really? No, no, that can't be true. And they were thinking, think now, what job wouldn't you take? So I thought, what job wouldn't I take? And I knew very quickly which jobs I would not take. Which and, jobs wouldn't you take? Um, I definitely wouldn't have taken... Well, I'm not going to say. And I, and it was DCMS, so... Which was the job? Was that probably like top of And I've list? always told Laura yeah. she promoted me. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Getting it out there. Um, uh, so in, in that role, I mean, how did you find the reaction to you receiving that appointment? Because... On oh, that day. absolute I mean, sheer and utter snobbery. Yeah, because it was pretty critical. It was horrendous. So you had on one hand people saying, oh, Nadine Doris has been picked because they want to fight the culture wars. And on the other hand, you had people saying, why has she you know, been quite critical of the appointment? Yeah. Um, were, you t- were you surprised by it? So I wasn't surprised by it. I expected something that, you know, along those lines. But for one thing, Katie, it's, you know, it's an absolute fact and I hate saying it because I hate playing the women card. But there are men, some men, who do have a problem with a woman from my background achieving because they've come from a completely different background and haven't yet quite achieved or probably will never achieve. And so I'm used to that. I do have to deal with that all the time. And, you know, you have to look at Alist- the way Alistair Campbell, you know, just like as abusively tweeted about me over the years. John Nicholson, in yes, you can just, I can just sit here and list off and names to you. But you kind of get used to that. But I suppose it was a bit of a surprise that the left, you know, the champions of people supposedly from backgrounds like mine, then piled in and attacked someone from my background. And people who had no idea who I was, did not know me in any way so whatsoever, knew nothing about me, had never heard me speak, knew nothing about me whatsoever, who decided to be so utterly abusive. And the only thing I can think is that, um, and, you know, we've discussed this a number of times, I think the fact that they realised that I'm not... I've, I've gone there to achieve, you know? I've gone there to deliver... I've taken this post up because things are going to happen. Online safety bill, you know, gone through second reading without even a vote. Things are going to happen. Channel 4 is going to be sold. The BBC licence fee is going to be reviewed very soon and is going to be changed. Things are going to happen under my watch. Now, I realise that over a long period of time, not a huge amount has been delivered from my department. I'm now in a position where I've got five bills to deliver and this department hasn't had five bills in 20 years. But I think they also, they knew that I was going to deliver and that was, that you know, the, the bills, they, the notions of Channel 4 being sold, the licence fee, BBC, all of those things have been in the ether for years. I think there was a sudden realisation that something might happen now. And I think that was part of the attack. Now let's talk about those various things that you have to do in your job. Um, you mentioned the online safety bill. Obviously, second reading gone through. There have been Tory MPs uh, talking about their concerns. You've had Steve Baker recently writing an op-ed about his. And then also at The Spectator, I think we've been pretty critical. So can we just say we've got 365 MPs. You've, ta- you've talked about one. There's actually two who've got concerns. So, you know, out of 365, I don't know what the percentage that is, but it's pretty minimal. So you, two, two MPs. So you're pretty confident about the next stage. So I think it's important that, you know, here in Westminster, where we're making this podcast now, people are, some people, a very small number of people are talking about freedom of speech actually across the country. 
the bill has been really welcomed, particularly by parents, prospective parents. And just in the past 24 hours, the Football Association, the Premier League, the English Football League have all come out in support of it. The Children's Commissioner is in support of the Online Safety Bill and a whole raft of stakeholders and charities, children's charities. So the, the very narrow conversation about freedom of speech is only happening here in Westminster, across the country. The bill has been really welcomed. And just on that point about freedom of speech, this bill, and it amazes me how many people haven't read it and are making freedom of speech comments on it, this bill actually protects and enhances freedom of speech from what it was before. So before, and I'll give you an example, we were dependent on the 2003 Miscommunications Act and the 1988 Act, I think it was. And so do you remember the Robin Hood Airport, uh, the, the guy who says he's going to bomb Robin Hood Airport? He was arrested, he was charged, he was convicted. That wouldn't happen today because that tweet he sent out was obviously a joke. That wouldn't happen today. Under the new bill now, he'd have to prove beyond reasonable doubt within a court that that tweet was intended to cause serious harm. And so that wouldn't even happen now. The bill has actually enhanced freedom of speech and, and has made the situation far better than it was before. So those people who are talking, and one of the criticisms that has made to me is, you're giving Nick Clegg and Mark Zuckerberg more powers. They have all the powers in the world they want right now. I couldn't possibly concede them more power. They have total power. They are the arbiters of free speech. They decide what content gets left online and what gets taken down. They decide who they're going to slap a fake news notice on or whose podcast they'll take down or whose YouTube videos or which journalistic content they will allow or won't allow on their sites. They are the arbiters of free speech. We've changed that so that actually comes back to, to, to enforcing free speech as a principle and not something that's decided by somebody on the West Coast. Now, if you'll forgive me being a small Westminster minority, just for one more question um, on that. And, and I do think that broadly, lots of people do support lots of things in terms of self-harm, lots of parts. But on that, just that freedom of speech element, I think what critics say, maybe two in the Tory party, there's more in the media, uh, will say is... Well, why in the media? Because but, the media's yeah. got carve-outs. The media has huge journalistic protections and, that it and didn't perhaps, have before. Yeah. And, perhaps, and, and this is, I suppose, just if I put one scenario to you, I think one of the concerns is this idea that if all these, you know, internet giants have, feel as though it is their duty to now do this and they've got, a, they might feel incentivized to take down more articles, to take Not down true. more posts. Because they have to, and with the bill, they have to be transparent and consistent. So with the, the relationship that Ofcom will now have with these tech giants, they have to, to show Ofcom what the basis is that they will be doing that is on and they will have to be consistent across the board and they can't take any content down unless they particularly journalistic content until they've informed a journalist that they're going to take it down tell them why they're going to do it give them a right of robust appeal and when they make their decision on that appeal be consistent on those decision making so as the situation is now they can take anyone's content down whenever they want. They will not be able to do, and they don't have to reply. So, you know, if they took something down that you, if they decide to remove our podcast, or they decide to remove something that you've written, they don't have to tell you they're removing it. They don't have to tell you why, and they don't have to respond to you when you ask them why. Under this bill, they will have to do all of those things. Just, just a final thing on that. So if we take... Okay, let's take 2018, Boris Johnson wrote an article which was quite controversial at the time uh, where he you know, said Muslim women wearing the burqa look like letterboxes. It was an example he gave. And lots of people widely condemned that. Do you think under the online harms, on online safety bill, you could have a situation where people think, well, that is an online harm uh, in terms of, you know... No, because it's part of public debate. So public democratic content and... Uh, anything which contributes contributes to public debate is not it it, it isn't applicable. That just can't happen. So it wouldn't happen. So no. Okay. Um, now the the final and the word I, intent, yeah. sorry, is very important in this bill. So anything that anybody does, they'd have to prove that they intended to cause harm. So, for example, somebody posting tweets about say most are misses a penalty or or just an example. And when people are 
writing tweets, bombarding social media posts, when those people are putting racist and quite disgusting comments out there, they are applicable. They do apply because they are obviously intended to cause harm. They're also illegal because they're illegal offline, so they will become illegal online. So that counts. So that really makes a difference. But a journalist writing, well, journalists are or a, know, a politician in the letterbox example. Yeah, you don't think that that's would, that's part. Whether it's whether it's them. something along those lines or whether it's the trans debate, whether people are just which is quite live at the moment. That is all part of discourse which is part of the public debate and that isn't applicable and just finally where do twitter pylons come in because i think you could take some of these examples such as an article and say well that's resulted in a twitter pylon on someone well it depends on what it, what it is yeah so a twitter pylon on a footballer because he missed a penalty of racist hatred is applicable twitter pylon on me because someone doesn't like the online safety bill doesn't count because that's public debate now um has, you mentioned, obviously, yourself and Twitter pylons. I wondered, you, you, as we talked a little bit, women particularly, but I would say particularly in your case, um, and perhaps also pretty Patel would fall into this, there's a certain level of venom online, um, often when, when you do things. And I wonder, has that fed into your experience with this online safety bill, um, the fact that, that you're all seeing, I suppose, from, from the darker sides of the web, of the web in terms of how people can use it to, you know, put lots of poison online well they do i think the you know the absolute mantra is don't look so don't i mean i certainly do you live by that? well you know in my job i don't have time to i literally don't have time to so i now depend on you know a team to say to me do you want to reply to this person or do you want to i've got no idea and when uh, when i'm told uh, by somebody in the team probably best not to switch on your phone for the next 24 hours i don't so you know i've got no i have no notifications I don't even have Twitter on my phone anymore, so... It's pr- probably a good way to have it. Well, More so it's, it's, it's on a computer, but I don't, you know, I, I just don't see the stuff that constantly comes up. Um, no, you seem very tough, t- to be honest, in the sense that you... Do I? Yeah, and I, that, that, I think that's the impression that people have of you, is that you are tough and you're, you're not put off by things. And there's been times when the Prime Minister's been under pressure and others haven't gone out to bat for him. And I just wondered, do you feel like you, are, you have, you know, thick skin on this stuff, or, or are people not seeing the fact that some of this criticism does get to you? Um, do I have a thick skin? So I think I just try and do what is the right thing to do. And, yeah, I mean, if I'm... I, the Prime Minister even have to ask me to go out... No, has to ask me to go out and defend the Prime Minister. I will do it if I think he's being unfairly attacked. So, again, it's um, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I've noticed that a lot of people today tend to be kind of quite risk of it. They don't like people not liking them. And so they'd rather not put their heads above the parapet. And that's where social media has changed behaviour. So whereas before other people would probably quite happily give a comment to a journalist or a newspaper in a conversation or in a quote, right now people are more reluctant to. And I know I, I know journalists find this more, they find it difficult now to get MPs to give them quotes and anything, particularly named quotes that because everybody's scared of what the online pylons will be or what will happen to them or their reputations. You know, one thing, you know, a horrible comment or something online just goes around the world in seconds, you know? And and so I'm probably old school, you know? I'm like 65 in a few weeks. I've just been here a long time. And so I'm, I'm less worried about my long-term career. So I'm less concerned about you know, getting a bad rep or or being attacked for supporting the Prime Minister. Whereas I think some people who've got a career in front of them, I think, oh, don't want to rock the boat just now, you know. So I think that's got something to do with it. Yeah, and I suppose if, if you've been someone who has spoken on various issues throughout your career and you're in Cabinet now, it's not as though you're saying, well, if anything, you'll be changing tack by doing something yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I said once in an interview, when someone said, what would you, why would you stop supporting the Prime Well, if I don't kicked a dog, obviously I'm not going to blindly support him, whatever he does. But, you know, it's... But he's the Prime Minister of the elected government. Of course, and I'm a Cabinet Minister. That is my job. It is my responsibility to... And it's part of collective responsibility to support the Prime Minister and to support the government. It's what I do. It's what every Cabinet Minister under Tony Blair did when Tony Blair was in power, and it's what I'm doing with Boris Johnson. Channel 4. Um, the, then 
announcement that it will be privatised obviously had led to backlash in some quarters, some in your own party, um, particularly on the One Nation wing, have been quite critical of it. Um, there are those who say the decision to privatise is punishment for the Channel 4's coverage being too um, biased to the left. Um, I wonder what you say to that, but also kind of what we can expect in terms of the next steps of this. So, um, you know, I- Child forism being sold for ideological reasons. I know those criticisms will be there, and there's nothing I can do to stop people who want to say that from saying it. It's, but it's not. It's, you know, Margaret Thatcher's idea to establish Channel 4, to use it as a seedbed to grow raw talent and independent talent and con- to make new British content was the right thing to do at the time. But she also wanted to sell it in. 1988 as Charles Moore has um, informed me and it's just the fact that we the state owns a broadcaster today is kind of quite bizarre and it's it's absolutely a a Thatcherite policy to sell Channel 4 and to allow it actually to because one of the problems at the moment is only 7% of independent production companies get their funding from Channel 4. That's a tiny amount. It's not doing even what it was established to do. And Channel 4 needs to raise money. And although, you know, we don't pay for the day-to-day running of Channel 4, when Channel 4 needs funding, it comes to the government. And what we need to do to allow, and if it needs borrowings, it comes to the government. And it's, you know, advertising, we're in a, in a world now where the main funding, the lifeblood of Channel 4, which was advertising, now has so many other places to go. Netflix is probably about to start advertising. So that's more competition that those advertisers, that Channel 4 is going to be facing because those advertisers will be moving to different places. So we want it to be able to, to raise revenue. We want it to grow. We want it to make fresh content. But, you know, it's not allowed to sell its content under its present license. It's not allowed to to produce and sell and and to grow in that way. It's just wholly dependent on advertisers. So how do we get more money? How do we let Channel 4 survive? How do we pump funding into it? We privatise it. We let it go and raise funding. We let it do what it's supposed to do. It can raise as much money as it likes. And Channel 4 can continue, but it will continue privately, not state-owned. And the great thing about it is, is that whatever it's sold for, we'll be able, I'll be able to pump that money back into the sector, particularly into training and skills, because we've got 17 studios that I'm aware of opening in the next 12 months, film studios in the UK, but an absolute lack of trained people and skilled people to work in those studios. So using that money from Channel 4 to train people in the skills that we need to get them into the film business, that's what I want to do with the money, to get it back into the sector. And it seems to me like it's a win-win. Channel 4 raises the investment it wants. We get to pump money back into the sector. Why wouldn't we do that? Let's see if some of your colleagues come around to that. Um. Well, actually, just to... to so, um, again, there are 365 MPs, and we've done a careful analysis of all of our MPs, and we very comfortably have the number that we need to get this through. Um, final two questions on the BBC. Um, you said that... Uh, in various kind of interviews and comments that ultimately there needs to be more of a focus. Um, um, I, I don't put words in your mouth so you can correct me, but almost, uh, it's perhaps something of moving away from kind of metropolitan elite to more working class um, opportunities. Uh, do you think they're listening? Are you seeing changes yet in terms of how the BBC approached some of the problems that you've raised? So, you know, Tim Davey himself, Director General, said that the BBC has a problem with impartiality. He had to, because if it didn't, why would we have had the Sorota review and the Dyson review and the 10-point plan and the the uh, the announcement about how they were going to implement that plan, plan to tackle a lack of impartiality within the BBC? It is a fact the BBC has a problem with impartiality. But, you know, don't lose, we can't lose sight of the fact that the BBC also does a fantastic job. It makes great programming. It's a global British brand across the world. Everybody loves the BBC. But that doesn't mean, you know, it's like having a family and someone in your family has, you know, a a problem. It's like pretending it's not there. It is there and it is an issue that needs to be dealt with. And I think there are, in terms of the longer term, the 
outlook for the BBC. You know, it's a, a licence fee model that was established in 1946, 45, 46. It's, it's completely out of date. It's all of their convictions, 76% of their convictions, 74 or 76% of their convictions are women because women quite often take the responsibility for the household bills. It's just, it's completely outdated. And so we are going to um, very soon announce that we are um, going to be looking very seriously at the how we fund the BBC moving forward and um, be moving through that process to get to the point where well ahead of the charter renewal in 27, we are ready to implement a new way of funding the BBC moving forward. So moving, so it's not going to look as it currently does. Just giving you a scoop there, Katie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so this will be moving away from perhaps the full TV licence model that we currently have? So the charter renewal when the licence fee model would come up is uh, 2027. So obviously that's, that's into the future. We need to look, that's five years away. So I've got the midterm review coming up, which will be announced very, very soon. And in that, we're going to be looking at how Ofcom hold the BBC to account. And then very shortly after that, we will be announcing um, other measures that we're going to put into place to start looking at how the BBC will be funded in the future so that we are well in time to have that in place for the charter renewal in 2027. If the Tories are still in power. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, now, the final question is one we ask everyone on this podcast, and I actually really want to know your answer because I imagine you've been given quite a lot of advice in your time, and I imagine you've probably ignored quite a lot of it, but I could be wrong. Um, <laughs> colleagues telling you what you should be doing in terms of Parliament and, and so forth. So what is the worst advice you've ever been given? I suppose the worst advice was when I began as an MP and I was worried about my daughters and because the youngest one was still quite young and a lot of advice I got was, oh don't worry, kids are adaptable, but they're not. Kids are not adaptable to their mother receiving abuse or, you know, I had a stalker for eight years, they're not adaptable to their mother having a stalker and yeah, they're that kids are not adaptable, that's a complete myth. And I think that was the worst piece of advice I was given. Thank you, Nadine.